Oh. So, believe it or not, a goal of computer research over the last 20 years has actually been to make the computer visible. To make a computer that's so easy to use that we don't even know we're using it. In 1965, a man called Ivan Sutherland wrote an essay he called The Ultimate Display. And um, it was a reflection on the technology of the day and a thought experiment about where it might possibly go. And I'm going to read you the last paragraph. He wrote, the ultimate display is, of course, a room within which the computer controls the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs would be confining and a bullet would be faking. So as a young PhD student, my mind was blown. And um, what Ivan Sutherland and his contemporaries understood was that computers unlock amazing capabilities. We can send files across the, what, that world in an instant. We can undo and redo things we've done wrong. We can um, visualize concepts that we have absolutely no intuition for. What they understood though was that these, the, the computer screens though were just a looking glass. And with the appropriate programming, such a display might literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. What if we could take the capabilities of digital information and binary and combine it with the phys physicality we've evolved from? So I want to talk about two examples with two different branches of technology. The first of which is projection. What if you took all the light bouncing around this room at the moment and replaced that light with pixels? What if information could appear anywhere? It could, the examples I've been talking about could appear on your desk. It could change in size and scale to better illustrate my point. And what would that world be like? So I'm a software engineer. I like writing code. So I decided to apply that to my own self. So this here is a coffee table. And what it is, is a way of making physical the process of writing software. The circles you see on it are bits of code. And you can push and pull them around. You can move them around. And to work on one, I physically have to pick it up and put it on my computer. And what that means is that we use, we're using the space around us to, sh to show what's going on. If I want to work on something you're working on, I have to go into your personal space and take it out. And that means that you'll be able to go, hang on a minute, I'm not quite finished working on that bit yet. And you'll be able to resolve a lot of the conflicts and discussions that you'd have in a meeting at the end of the day immediately. We also found that people who make territories that sort of get all the bits they're working on and punch them up around them, and this is my responsibility. And then when they were done with it, they fling it off to the other side of the room, or the other side of the table, sorry, for, that person, for another person to deal with. And we've also observed people moving much more fluidly between working on a task that's very easy, very easy for one person, it's well understood, they can get on with it quickly alone. They can move fluidly into working on a collaborative task that requires more than one person. And they could do that because of the shared awareness of the information that was spread out across the physical space. So for me, that was interesting. It sort of proved to me a little bit that these things <coughs> this way of thinking about digital information could work. But I was only, you know, I'm a scientist, I like data points, and this was just one data point. It was one application scenario. I had no idea I was to suggest it would work in others. So what I did was I built a toolkit. I made it very easy for people to go and use the skills they have to make these displays themselves. And we just sort of put it out there. We gave it to people and said, download it if you want, make something, share it if you'd like, and we wanted to observe those results. And what came back was really, and it's a simple point, but the simplest things are best. If you try and create too much, too many abstractions within that, it's not, it's not as good. So I want to show you a couple of examples that I would like. Here, a computer gently wakes you up in the morning, slowly raises the level of light. And then I can feel around with my blurry eyes to touch the wooden slats on the bed. And then these slats I can use to turn on and off the lights. 
I can also, if I want, view the latest headlines and the information will appear on the top of the headboard of the bed. And what that's doing, that information is looking at the space and it's saying, right, I can fit here and I'm going to design myself, I'm going to adjust myself to fit that space. Another example is this specialist piece of industrial equipment. I don't know how it works, but if I hover my hand near it, the instructions appear in my language on the machine. And what that's doing is it's no longer, because the information can change very easily, it's letting me use my muscle memory, my sense of spatial learning, to, <coughs> to learn about and explore that machine without necessarily having a manual. So that's kind of, that's, so the projection was cool, it was interesting, you could do some fun things with it. But the second branch of technology I want to talk to you about is digi digital fabrication. And to see if that could be used to take the idea a bit further, to make it more physical, to make it change the physical environment. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about a machine I built with some colleagues, Chris White from Jason Alexander, and the Nelson Everett Info Lab, called the Reform. And the Reform takes the idea of the ultimate display far more literally. Whereas on normal screens, we've got the ability to touch as input and in, out, in terms of output, we will change the images on it. What Reform does is it allows you to input and output physical shape within its chassis. So we effectively entangle a clay model with a digital design file. And you can see this sort of holographic interface here, which sort of acts as a bridge between the two. And this means we can use our hands for things that hands are good at. I can feel the weight of the game control I'm making. I can see if it's going to be appropriate. I can try to sit sat down. I can try to stood up. I can smooth off the edges as I'm designing it. I can do things that my hands can intuitively do. But at the same time, I can use the machine for things that machines are good at. I can <coughs> raise up this virtual plane here to just tell the machine where to cut and then have the mill head come out and make a very precise finish. And by designing in both the physical and the digital world simultaneously, what you do is you let yourself iterate very rapidly and in lots of different ways. I can check these buttons out, see if they fit there. And I can also grab a pen and I can annotate the object and then the machine will work with me to drill holes where I've made little dots. So not only can you improve the process by combining the digital and physical, you can also explore new capabilities. So if you look closely, you can see that little button on the game controller flashing in and out. You can take an operation like undo and redo, control Z, well, something I've become very familiar with over the last couple of days, <laughs> and make it apply to physical objects. So here I'm smooshing that button with a big clutzy finger. I put it back in the machine and I press undo, and the machine works out how to repair the damage. So when you combine, that, when you take that away from clay and take it a decade further and you say have printable electronics, I think you begin to explore what it's like to, you know how we have phone updates, we, we, often, we often get a, an update on the phone and it takes ages to install. You could, put your, you could also have hardware updates, you could put your phone into the machine and then have say, update the camera, please, and the machine will come out, cut away the old camera, and then build a new, much better one in its place. In an ultimate computer, you never need to throw anything away. So, the examples I've shared there are just, I think, the two examples of invisible changes. They're smaller specs in a larger evolution about computer capabilities but also a revolution in terms of how we're thinking about them. And the thing about revolutions is, particularly this one, this isn't the first time it's happened. The first programmers wrote machine code, binary, zeros and ones, and they looked at the people typing on command lines, typing on keyboards, and went, gosh, I mean, why are you doing that? You've got a 10 million pound computer over there, and you're making it sit there and wait for you to do something. What a waste of resources. Similarly, the people typing on command lines looked at the people using mice and keyboard and graphical user interfaces and went, oh no, you've reduced my precise, sophisticated operating system into an idiot-proof button path. <laughs> but, equally, the pe but those people 
typing commands, didn't necessarily see Hollywood in CGI. And with each step, you expand what a computer is capable of. And now we're stood here with our smartphones, and we can't exactly see from where we are how precisely a physical computer would be valuable. We don't know how it can work. We don't know where it will have the most impact. But to quote a guy called Brett Victor, who's in the field, our ability to articulate an idea lies behind our ability to understand it. And our ability to understand it often lags behind the embodiment which first gives it life. So I believe that computing is over the next I believe that computing is going to stop being about specifying instructions for applications, which were then constrained to a particular device. I think it's going to instead become about expressing our intentions to ecosystems of technology, which can then go and figure out what to do based on the constraints we give it. I think we're cresting on an age of optimization. And what I mean by that is that I think we're going to be taking all the information and all the data we're gathering. We're going to take all the sensor feeds, the internets of things, and instead of funneling those, funneling that insight into a small screen or a dashboard, which then the human uses to make a decision, we're going to be giving our computers the agency to find a way to modify that, the environment to suit the goals we give it. You can see it already. You've got AIs like Alexa, Cortana, and Siri, and you can say to Siri, hey, I'm, I'm hot. And what I think will start to happen is that they will go and query the environment and say, well, what can we do about this? And the environment will go, well, I can turn on the window, or turn on the air conditioning, and then it will make that choice for us. And if it doesn't have permission to make that choice, it might save that information so that when the next time it's designed, it can be drawn on. And I think as we move toward an ultimate display. It's really important that we all design it to make sure that what we build is possible for all of us. It's a, it is positive for all of us. It's, it's something we all want. We, and we have to ask broad questions for that. We can't just let technology follow its own path. We have to make sure that we consider more ramifications. And I think in doing so, that's, that leaves us at a very exciting and a very scary point history. So I'm going to leave you with a proverb, a proverb. It says, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. But if you want to travel far, travel together. Thank you very much.